Hi, everyone. Today we have an awesome presentation for you. We have Bob Quillen from Veek Function and Marcus Noggle from Red Hat and the Camary community. So the way that we're going to do this today is that Bob is going to go over some research findings that they have um, from a research that they commissioned for the, on the topic of app modernization. And then afterwards, Marcus is going to come on and tell us of how this compares how those funds compared to what he's experiencing with customers out in the field. And once we get through both of those sections, then we'll have time for any questions that you guys may have. You can put those questions in the chat uh, throughout the presentation. Just know that we likely won't get to them to the end of it. Um, and with that, Bob, it, it's all yours. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, well, I'm going to go ahead and jump on into it. I'm excited to be here, talk about our, our findings and this uh, research report we just completed uh, with Wakefield. And really part of our, our goal here was to benchmark where the where the industry is with app modernization, you know, considering we've been through maybe 10 to 20 years of app modernization projects, many uh, not successful, many are. Um, and we'll talk about kind of the, uh, the goals of those projects, kind of talk about the, the terms uh, and, uh, you know, baseline how people are looking at modernization, talk about why things fail, why things succeed, and maybe some recommendations for success. So, um, so we just completed this research um, just a month or two ago, and uh, the research is available on our website. Feel free to you know, dive in and look at all the, all the, the details around it. We talked to 250 uh, developer teams and architects um, and who are actually in the business of maintaining uh, monolithic applications and Java applications. Um, so this was a um, really focus on these application teams, the challenges they have, and kind of where the industry is today. Um, so if we take a look at you know where the market is currently, I'd say that 78% you know, of the market is really in this meaty part of the middle um, where they're planning to modernize, but they haven't started yet. Many have just started um, and some have made progress, but that's really the mass majority is in that area. The other 22%, 8% haven't started at all, 14% have made significant progress, but the mass majority is really focused on modernization as a, a key area uh, of progress. They're trying to, um, in many ways, uh, figure out you know, what's went wrong, but also how to improve it and move it forward in a much more effective way. And Bob, do you want to go into your into a slideshow view so that way you can, um, yeah, there we go. Is that not showing up in slideshow or? Yeah, it, it just shows all of them right now. So like when you were talking about the, uh, the okay. different stages earlier, it mm -hmm. was still on, it was still on the cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm sharing it. Um, and I am going to slideshow mode. Let's see. Um, Yeah, so you're not seeing that as a overall window right now, right? We're seeing it. Um, we're seeing all the slides and mm. the main slide. Yeah. Um, there you go. Let's do it this way. Okay. So, yeah. So the um, if you take a look at the headlines and the headlines in um, this particular survey, seventy nine percent of modernization efforts are failing. Um, and there's a high cost over one and a half million to, you know, many are costing over $2 million in terms of the overall project. So it's expensive and uh, it's taking a lot of time over a year and a half, sometimes over two years is the average for these projects. So they're taking a long time. There's a lot of risk. There's a lot of failure. There's a lot of frustration in the marketplace. And I think that is basically consistent with what we've seen, uh, throughout the, uh, the industry for the last probably five to 10 years. Um, now, if we take a look at basic terms of how you define app modernization, there's been a lot of confusion, I think, in the marketplace, too. Of what is modernization? It's been kind of used in many different forms and factors. And there's many R's. <laughs> we kind of joke about there was five R's and there's seven R's. We've seen nine R's in terms of app modernization from replacing to rehosting to replatform to refactoring. We really wanted to get a baseline first of how people are defining the term app modernization. Um, and, you know, what's, what's encouraging is we're starting to see a, a clear understanding that refactoring and in second place rewriting are really the two key areas people focus on when they talk about app modernization. Um, so 60% say the true definition of 
modernization is refactoring. So um, a lot of lift and shift and rehosting and replatforming has happened over the last probably five to 10 years. And I think that's a, that's a key issue um, that we've seen and people trying to do a, a stop gap or you know, kind of kick the can down the road in terms of trying to uh, modernize by migrating and lifting and shifting a monolith into the cloud itself. But we're also seeing from other surveys too that migration is beginning to move down the priorities and modernization is beginning to move up and has actually superseded migration as one of the key issues uh, that people are trying to benefit from uh, when they look at overall priorities in terms of IT and IT investment. So what is the overall goal of app modernization? And this is just where it gets kind of, kind of interesting as we've begun to split the, the survey in terms of the business leaders perspective and then the technical perspective from the architects who are actually um, in, in charge and actually have their hands on the project itself. So exec executives look at app modernization in terms of, you know, how do I increase innovation? How do I uh, lower my technical debt, get the product moving more quickly, create more scalability in my business? Um, and if you take a look at architects, they kind of look at the other side of the coin where innovation has a direct inverse relationship to uh, engineering velocity and technical debt. So they want to increase uh, velocity. They also want to innovate. They also want to increase scalability on the architect side or technical side, but they also are beginning to focus, you see from the architects, the emergence of the people side of things. So it's not just about the business, it's not about the engineering and the technology itself, but it's also about the developer side and the cultural side of one, it's hard to ramp up new developers into an older monolithic application. Two, it's hard to retain those and keep those um, developers motivated and employed. Uh, and it's, it's even hard to organize them successfully because a monolithic application usually implies a monolithic team where you have a lot of people working on the same thing. It's hard to break it into smaller groups. Um, it's harder to work in a remote environment like we are today in many cases where we have remote offices. So, so what happens as we start these projects? You know, what are the obstacles that people face? Well, the top reason um, we see for pushback is risk. And, and risk is a big issue. 97% of, the, of these organizations are seeing lo some level of pushback in every modernization project. But any application that's up and running now, it's business critical, you're running your business on it, key business flows are still going through it, you know, even though it's been around for 10 or 20 years, the risk of changing is very high. Executives also look at um, the cost associated with that and the ROI of actually doing the work. Um, the architects look at risk also, probably from a technical perspective, but they also look at, once again, the cultural side of things. You know, there's a, a fear of change inside the organization, and there's a fear of like losing the role itself. So um, losing their role and beginning to, um, you know, lose their part of the organization. What's interesting as you look at refactoring projects, more and more we're seeing people were able to maintain that team and move them forward, which is nice. Um, if you're, you maintain the logic, you can help build a bridge between the older technology into new cloud native technologies and move those teams forward. So uh, a proper organization, a proper plan can help you then um, move, move the stakeholders forward without the fear of losing their jobs. So it actually has a good cultural benefit um, if it's organized correctly. So why are you know, we have see all this, this huge number around application modernization projects failing. Why are they failing? So the executives say, one, a failure to set expectations correctly or accurately. And that includes not uh, looking at the cost correctly, maybe not or understanding the org structure that's required. And this is interesting. There's a, there's, um, there's a lack of um, information available to build a clear business case from an executive point of view. And kind of they're focused on how these things are starting. And uh, there's not a clear before and after or a clear understanding between the technical side and the business side of what they're trying to accomplish. So that was one of the key findings we saw is that how you start really implies and uh, helps how you finish um, in terms of the results. So on the architect side of things, um, they call out the lack of intelligent tools. And we talked about the challenges of doing modernization data, which is being a very manual process takes a lot of time, takes a lot of you know, unraveling and unwinding and, and uh, dealing with all this uh, tangled web of, of dependencies. So being able to have the tools that help you through that um, is really something that's been lacking from an architect's point of view. 
the training, complexity, all play into the ability to set expectations correctly. And I would say the lack of tools actually um, is also impacting the ability to set expectations because you can't see inside uh, the uh, monolith themselves, you can't actually understand what it's going to take to refactor or modernize that application. You're kind of just making a best guess. And they all agree that the org structure needs to be correct around making this um, project successful. So, you know, one thing we talk about a lot, and I just add a little color to this is, you know, A, we're looking to what are you trying to achieve in setting expectations? I go back to, you know, splitting the, the view between migration and modernization. And the cloud providers over the last five to 10 years, they're really focused on migration, lifting and shifting monoliths into the cloud. It's faster, it improves your security, DevOps, helps you close down some data center technologies, but really you're not modernizing anything. I think that's um, beginning to um, be a, an evolution of understanding how people are looking at the modernization problem. If you want to get that velocity that people are looking for, if you want to increase innovation, if you want to begin to get those um, that application scalability, really you're not going to get that unless you look at refactoring, re-architecting, rewriting. So I think that we're seeing through this survey more and more understanding that migration does not equal modernization and the need to actually, if you want to achieve these goals, which are the top goals of modernization, you really have to be looking at some of these different R's besides rehosting, replatforming. The other thing that we also see around expectations is some people try to do the quick fix. And that quick fix happens by throwing an API layer on top of uh, the monolith and maybe putting a nice shiny UI on top of it too. Uh, once again, it's kind of a, a stopgap. Uh, you get some benefits, you get a nice UI, you can, um, celebrate that the API provides some capabilities that you didn't have with just the monolith, but you still have a monolith. And you still have the issues that you're unable to meet those requirements, meet the goals, et cetera. And these are two things that we see, that migration versus modernization and the uh, jumping to a quick fix approach. That's why a lot of these um, expectations are not being met and why a lot of people are feeling like modernization is too risky, uh, there's not a big, a good plan set in place, et cetera. So. so what are the most difficult steps in the modernization project? And once again, we split this between the business leaders, the executives, and the architects on the technical side themselves. So the executives look at securing budget and resources, and actually it's where the architects agree. Starting, how you start, how you set the plan, how you build the business case, um, and how you understand what you're going to focus on um, really breaks down into you know, a successful project later on, but that's the most typical step. And that's an agreement, interesting, between the executives and the architects. Um, executives say it's difficult to know what to modernize. And I think this comes down to an understanding of being able to look inside the model of having the tools, the data, understanding where the technical debt is being carried, et cetera. Um, training and preparing a staff, once again, on the cultural side. And then finally, architects talk about executing the project successfully. So having the right tools in place, right plan in place, et cetera. So there's a planning and assessment phase, there's an execution phase, and then there's the organization around making that successful. So having a really clear plan of how to make this happen is important. Having the tools to execute it is important and having the staff ready um, and, and uh, trained to make that happen. So. so as we talk about what are the top Two challenges with refactoring, and people look at refactoring being the top um, option when you go into a modernization project. Executives say it takes too much time, and architects say it takes you know, it's too difficult. And once again, I think this is a, um, a, a indication of complexity. I think it's a, a indication of a lack of tools and a lack of understanding of what it's going to take to make this successful. If there's a common basis, the common language up front in terms of assessment having the data up front that you agree to, if you understand the challenges that you're going to be up against, then it becomes much more um, effective in terms of executives understand how much time it's going to take, what the goals are going to be, and architects will have a, a much better understanding of the complexity and the difficulty to make this happen. But right now, it's a big challenge. But the challenge is something that is, you know, you don't really have an option. Um, you need to be able to um, you know, the, the option of not modernizing is you have to keep maintain the monolith. So, you know, if you keep doing that, it's going to, you're going to have an issue of continuing to keep up with the business requirements. And this is where the executives come in. They look at the business side of things 
And why can't they keep up with the business requirements? Because of this growing technical debt that's weighing you down. It becomes a drag on the application team. And then find developers that can maintain and then having the time to fix and add new features. So features, business requirements talk to the business side of things. Technical debt and developers talk about the technical and the cultural side of things. Um, architects, when they look at the problem, one of the top challenges maintaining it, it comes down to um, ramping up developers, recruiting developers, um, actually retaining those developers, organizing the team. Then that drives the ability to keep up with the growing technical debt. And that tipping point that we're all seeing around technical debt itself when it becomes too much to handle, and then that translates into keeping up with the business requirements. So see developers, technology, and business requirements, once again, pretty consistent in terms of how they look at it, but kind of a, a, a reorganization of how people um, approach the problem. So people are being successful with application modernization projects. And the ones that are being successful cite um, to having the proper resources and the tools in place to be successful around these projects. So what are the patterns and the best practices for these high performing teams? Uh, one, they have to have the right organizational structure and the tools, the schedule, and the resources to do that. And really that comes back to that planning process, planning, having the right information in advance, taking your time to have the before and after. I got to be able to understand what I'm going to try to accomplish, benchmarking where I am now, and be able to show afterwards that I did accomplish those goals. Um, and that includes having you know, goals that are well-defined, having sufficient tools and having the time. So in, in, in my perspective, I think that's actually some of the key elements that we're seeing across the board of how we make these uh, projects much more successful. So, um, so key takeaways, um, app modernization is, is, a, is a key initiative. 92% um, are planning to or have already started their app modernization projects. But we see a lot of failures. They're taking a lot of time um, and taking a lot of money. So the pushback is something that everyone deals with, but having a, a strong understanding of the cost, the risk, and complexity up front can help mediate those issues. So then it helps you then prioritize those going forward. And the architects and executives agree that the challenges are there. There's clear reasons for failure, but there's also um, a path for success of having the right tools having the right training and focusing on not only the technology side, but the people side of things too. So, so that kind of wraps up the Wakefield research uh, report and I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing right now and kind of hand it back to Jonathan to talk more about it. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Awesome insights. So everyone, if you have questions as uh, we go through this, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, now I'm going to bring out Marcus. So Marcus has experience in the field and, oh, I thought it'd be interesting to get his insights on and see how these findings match up to his experience. Marcus, if you want to give a light intro and, and yep. just share what you <laughs> I what don't you want think. to waste your time. So uh, Marcus here. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I work, as you can see, I, I, I work at Red Hat. <laughs> so uh, um, I'm a senior architect uh, uh, with Red Hat Services um, in the EMEA solutions practice. So basically what that means is I'm helping customers across uh, Europe and the Middle East uh, onboarding applications and modernizing applications onto uh, Red Hat's uh, spin of Kubernetes, which is obviously OpenShift and the whole tool chain around it. So. Um, uh, furthermore, I also internally at Red Hat lead the application uh, modernization community and as such, I'm also well feeding back our field experiences, stories from the trenches, if you will, uh, back into the conveyor community and, and also help build best practices around that. And so, well, first and foremost, I would like to uh, thank Bob for sharing this and, and commissioning this research because it basically mirrors 100% what I see in the field uh, uh, every day. So um, I encourage every one of you um, to go to the vFunction website and download that uh, report in full um, because it's very well worth reading. Um, so I I did <laughs> and I did regret it. <laughs> so I just wanted, I just wanted to um, to elaborate on, on, on a couple of things that uh, stand out for me, what I see in the field, and maybe that can uh, uh, can help you listeners, viewers, um, um, uh, tackle those challenges uh, a bit better or be prepared when you when you encounter these. As, as Bob just said, uh, what one of the one of the key things we see at customers is and what's what's really 
really super important is uh, making the case and that uh, it sounds super obvious but the thing mm -hmm. is uh, what we, what we see as red hat services and and probably this uh, uh, there's people from from uh, SIs, Red Hat partners uh, um, that have seen the same thing is when we go to customers, uh, they tell us, yeah, we, we need microservices, we want to onboard that stuff. And we we have to ask, okay, so that is the means, but what is it that you're trying to achieve? Is it cost reduction? Uh, is it re uh, reduction of technical debt? Is it developer flexibility? Do you want to free up your developers from manual and menial tasks of, of keeping the monolith alive basically to, uh, uh, to, to free up that time for, for real innovation. Do you want to move ahead of, uh, uh, of, of the pack of your competitors? Um, so what is basically, what is the why? Why are you starting this? Why are you, well, basically investing money, time, people, people's time um, to, uh, to start this endeavor? What, what is it? And, and the, the important thing is throughout that whole, um, uh, modernization uh, project executives will typically, as Bob just said, and it also mirrors what what, what we see. Uh, those things take time. There is no pixie dust that you sprinkle over the application, and then everything will be fine. Um, you have to invest. Uh, um, you have to invest a considerable amount of time to do that. But um, uh, one of one of the key things is uh, those executives would want to have some kind of feedback. So they will naturally not be in, in the project all the time, but they would want uh, some reports. So basically having a baseline of where are we starting? What are we trying to do? What is the application portfolio? Planning that properly, grouping it, analyzing it, assessing it and grouping it into, well, these are the low hanging fruit. This is, for example, something that we can provide value with uh, very early on. Uh, uh, migrating that because it's it's very simple and it will give the team that's doing that some some experience how to handle the new technology how to handle the uh, how to deal with the uh, with hopefully a, a better uh, better uh, uh, team structure so all these things um, those need to be those need to be properly planned and uh, planned scheduled and uh, well if you don't have a baseline, if you don't, if you don't know where you're starting from, mm -hmm. then you can tell the executives who are basically opening their pocket. Um, okay, so this is what you, this is what you wanted, but um, uh, this is where we started, and this is our progress, and and these are the improvements. So, um, um, being part of the conveyor community, uh, there's one thing uh, probably you want to look into: uh, Pylorus providing some some dashboards on the typical. Um, uh, software development uh, metrics um, in terms of uh, velocity, uh, uh, um, mean time to recovery, et cetera, et cetera. I won't dive into that now, but this is this is one tool, for example, that that uh, can help you doing that. But um, this is this is the one uh, this is the one finding making the case that really stands out because mm -hmm. if you start wrong, there will be no chance to really uh, uh, to really amend starting on the wrong, wrong foot hello so um that's that's really that's really crucial um and so through the whole project also tying that back into uh, um uh, into the strategy that you're following is also uh, uh, super important for, for example just one I won't obviously share customer names here but, but but one customer was saying okay i need to i need to um basically my primary driver is I have a renewal upcoming with vendor ABC and I was thinking about moving off of that platform anyways and now is the, now is the time to not only migrate my monoliths from A to B but also modernize these because I have to touch them anyway. Um, so, um, but the primary motivation for that was, uh, uh, for that was cost. So um, that will inform the strategy that you're uh, uh, that you're following. So these applications that are they had more. They have they have 105 applications actually mm -hmm. uh, that have to be migrated. And those uh, those were that were on that specific platform that uh, was uh, with a renewal around the door. They basically needed to move these first and tackle these first before uh, before all the other ones. Although some of the other ones might have been slightly easier, um, but as you see. 
what the executives what the executives uh, uh, target outcome in this case cost saving is uh, also has a huge impact on what comes first basically so mm -hmm. that's that really stands out um yeah, yeah bob go, was, go ahead <laughs> yeah, yeah, no i was, I was gonna uh chime in a bit too that the uh yeah i was yeah, you know, not not surprised at the pain and the issues and the cost and all the different complexities of doing uh, of modernization. But yeah, the uh, resounding um, kind of consistency around the lack of a business plan, the need for a better upfront planning, does call into you know re remind me that there, there's just not a good way to measure technical debt, way to understand the complexity of these applications before you start them. And I think that's part of the part of the challenges of having the, the data. Um, that's um, measurable. That's uh, that's uh, calculated. That begins to you know help you both from a technical perspective have confidence how long it's going to take. What are the, what's the first service I want to pull out, or maybe how I'm going to prioritize applications too. Maybe this is highly complex. It's going to take me extra time. I know that now. Um, I had I, my gut told me it was complex because I'm kind of stuck in the middle of it. Um, but I have these three other applications which are a little less complex, still mission critical. But maybe I get those done first, or maybe I can um, you know outsource those while I work on this with my key application team. So, yeah, the prioritization is is important. Having the tools to look in advance and try to understand deeper what the technical debt is. That's that's a uh, kind of a, a key kind of part of the understanding. That, that there's an interesting question here around rewriting versus refactoring and rearchitecting and so you know how to decide between those and also what's the difference um and uh maybe I, we can also talk about that in terms of um refactoring i would put on, on a spectrum refactoring rearchitecting and rewriting kind of also kind of blend together if you have a monolith and you want to begin to pull out um, services out of that uh, but keep the code itself um, and refactor that particular set of code. Really, it's maintaining the code, but beginning to change the architecture from a monolithic architecture, potentially to a microservice or cloud native architecture. It's typically, refactoring is in, in that mode. Rearchitecting might be take, take, taking you know, some of the applications and services, putting them together, maybe you know, throwing some of the monolith away and adding in, in new services. And then a full rewrite is actually starting to rewrite the actual business logic. We find a lot of times with Mollus, the, the code is actually is working and it de-risks the actual project by maintaining the actual original source code, but just beginning to take that um, set of code that's in the monolith that represents a, a domain, um, beginning to pull that out into a service and use that as its first step uh, to modernization. So, but there is a kind of a spectrum that's, that's connected from refactoring to rearchitecting to rewriting. And sometimes people kind of move between them <laughs> um, synonymously. So, uh, but they basically are about retaining and beginning to move that application forward in terms of its architectural. Uh, I'm sure you've got a lot of background with that, Marcus, too. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so one thing uh, just, uh, uh, just to add here, maybe a little bit of a, of a um, uh, well, some, some experience uh, from uh, from the field is um, when talking to uh, uh, to executives and also architects, uh, as as you said. So I said one hundred percent. What what uh, uh, what came came out of that report uh, uh, um, that totally resounds with me. Uh, the thing is risk. Well, no custom. Well, or the other way around. All customers are naturally risk averse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's yeah. uh, we we don't want to derail their business, right. uh, but uh, we need to achieve those goals. So when we talk about specifically monoliths, I'm not talking about this simple thing. I have a super small Spring Boot application that I need to onboard into container. That's not the use case here. But uh, most of most of the critical business applications they have grown over time, and naturally they have grown bigger and bigger. And so um, there won't be uh, there won't be a a um, um, uh, or they shouldn't be at least uh, a big bang approach. So developing behind closed curtains for 18 months and then coming out with a new version and then finding out, okay, that didn't, didn't resound with my users or it didn't, uh, we, we only captured like 80% of the functionality. So what you would be doing is applying the strangler pattern. And mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for that, for that absolutely also need to 
uh, you need to analyze uh, analyze the monolith, uh, uh, see where are the in, in the uh, um, domain driven design speak, uh, where are the bounded contexts, uh, where are the transactional contexts, etc. Uh, to carve out to carve out bit by bit, service by service, and um, uh, the thing is the advantage. Coming back to what I was saying about risk. The advantage of that is if you're doing if you're doing this in this stepwise approach, what will what what will probably happen in the course of uh, of that project is that you have implemented something not quite right. So with what you can do is then you can basically throw away what you what you did or amended or whatever, and for the time being sw switch back on that service in the monolith because it's still mm -hmm. there. So right. you're not you're not throwing it away. You have to find means, and there's tools around that as well. Um, uh, you have to uh, uh, you have to uh, uh, define uh, define basically an an API that will then connect your new monolith. Uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> no, definitely not your new microservice <laughs> to that old monolith. And uh, if something fails, you can basically uh, see what went wrong and switch uh, switch that back. So that takes out a lot of risk uh, out of that approach uh, over an, an um, right um, uh, um, a big bang approach. So yeah, that's, I think that's definitely. But but uh, as 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 Bob said, you need to know where to make those mm -hmm. uh, uh, where where to apply the knife. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> In the yeah. Speaking. Yeah, the um, you know, one of the patterns of success that we've seen is the for those very complex, you know, tens of millions of lines of code monoliths, megaliths, you might call them, that that an iterative approach or a selective approach where people are iterate, they do one service at a time, pull that out, maybe they do another service um, and get some success, maybe they leave some services behind. So they part of the uh, upfront planning is to say I'm not, it's not a big bang like you said. This is something that um, requires some iterative. Um, uh, you might some ways you're leaving the model, some on the model left behind. You're pulling out some services that are critical. Maybe they're going to combine with some other services you've already already done. So um, I think the you know, that's a for, for our most successful projects. People have taken an iterative approach, or they've gone in selectively said, "I know there's three services I, I want to pull out. I need to find out where they are, what the most effective way to do that is, and begin to strangle the rest of the model left off." So. Um, and I think that's a, a another key a key pattern for um, people who are um, looking to communicate what are my what are my plans how am I going to have early successes and you know claim some and, and de-risk the process too and claim early success too so yeah. absolutely and one 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 thing that probably uh, most of most of you already know um, uh, from the uh, from the Kubernetes uh, community well. To be to be technically correct, we're talking about modernization, and that is uh, uh, that is not in its entirety tied to containers and Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. However, that is ninety nine percent of the use cases these days. Mm -hmm. But you can still modernize without uh, without containers. But let's just focus on the ninety nine percent and forget about the one percent for the moment. Uh, what what can help you with that is. Um, uh, evaluating uh, Qvert and, and uh, tools to migrate your existing VMs, VM deployment of your monolithic application and move that onto Kubernetes. And the VM in all its complexity in uh, in the megalith, as you, I like that word, <laughs> um, uh, as you just said, that lives in Kubernetes. Why would we do that, you might ask. Uh, the thing is, you can then apply the strangler pattern and you only have one platform to manage. So it still, it, it lives in Kubernetes. Uh, the VM is configured via, uh, uh, via uh, Kubernetes artifacts. So uh, basically everything is Kubernetes and you can basically shift the functionality slowly but steadily in, in a continuous iterative approach from that monolith so that VM will get smaller and smaller while your microservices, your native Kubernetes artifacts will uh, uh, will become more and more and you will gain more and more flexibility. So that's also one thing uh, to consider. Um, yeah. yeah, I'd say that, that's, a, that's a great pattern. Um, the, uh, where I've seen some customers stop is like they get it into Kubernetes and they leave it there for a while. 
yay, we're successful. And they've done the migration. <laughs> yeah. and there's a level of celebration that we're in the cloud running on Kubernetes. And then yeah. um, six and nine months later, they realize that they, they're eating up way too much uh, CPU memory and they don't have any of that orchestration control. So, yeah, we all, um, yeah. We, yeah. we have these discussions. So, so that, and that is, that is not, that is not only tied to, to actual VMs using mm -hmm. Kubert, but uh, right. we see that every day, uh, like uh, uh, containers that are actually mm -hmm. VMs. If yeah. you're really, if you're really mm -hmm. honest about it, mm -hmm. it's it's just a VM that is not a V. It's not called a VM, but it's mm -hmm. it's monolithic. It takes minutes to start up. Um, it has some very specific requirements. It needs some some modifications on the on the Kubernetes nodes to be able to run. So really right. nightmares, mm -hmm. and that is not, and that's why it's super important to plan this correctly and ask mm -hmm. the customer, what is it that you're trying to achieve? Because mm -hmm. none of these migrations, it will tick one of like 20 boxes. Mm -hmm. So it's now running on Kubernetes. Yeah, great. But what yeah. have you actually achieved? Nothing. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's why I, I'm always trying to um, reinforce that a migration is fine, as long as it's in the context of a broader modernization project. Um, but exactly. I think we've seen um, time and time again, people stop with the migration and they come back a year or two later and realize they're, they've have um, a, a kind of remorse, migration remorse or lift and shift remorse. They're up there in the cloud, they're eating up a lot of bandwidth, they're eating up a lot of um, the costs in the cloud and they're not getting the benefits they, they wish they had. So, um, so yeah, it's continuing on with the process, having that full kind of uh, um, continuous view of what happens next. And uh, I think the good news is that, you know, from the survey and from other kind of indications in the marketplace, uh, we are seeing people beginning to understand the difference between migration and modernization. Cloud providers are beginning to push on that much more. We're seeing um, an interesting emergence of um, Gen 1 uh, SaaS vendors and cloud vendors who've been in the cloud maybe five to 10 years, who were originally a monolith, now looking to do a, a modernization. So they're already in the cloud, they're a cloud vendor. Um, and they've been running as a monolith um, successfully for maybe five to seven years. Now they're looking at trying to modernize and take advantage of the rest of uh, the benefits of containers and Kubernetes and, and, and microservices. So, um, so yeah, I think there's a, a broad spectrum of people. There's the older uh, monoliths that are sitting on prem, but there's also monoliths that are in the cloud already that need to be addressed. So. Yep, absolutely. So, so guys, um, I actually have a good good amount of questions that have arose mm -hmm. since you guys have been able to dig deeper into this. So the first one is, um, and Bob, you may want you may want to go for this first. How do you define rewriting and its differences with refactoring? Yeah, and I think uh, yeah, it's a it's something that we've we've touched on in, in the survey itself, and <laughs> you see it. I mentioned the, the seven R's, the nine R's, the five R's around modernization, but um, in, in kind of going back to that view of refactoring can actually take the existing code and begin to refactor how it's being uh, applied within the architecture. So it's a it's a kind of re-architecting. So re refactoring, re-architecting have a kind of a similarity and a rewriting is actually beginning to rewrite the actual code itself. So with refactoring able to maintain the business logic, you actually begin to carve out the domains, find that code itself. It de-risks the process. You begin to move from a, um, a monolithic architecture and refactoring it into a microservice architecture. Um, but that requires you understanding domains, being able to strangle off the old, old monolith flows and beginning to move that into this new architecture. A full re-architecture and a rewrite tends to actually get into a, a broader project. We see people starting with a refactor and then they kind of go into a, and then rewriting some new code. Um, but also then we are checking some other things. So there's a, I think it, people move back and forth in terms of those projects, but um, they, they have similarities in terms of if you have code that works, you want to de-risk it, you want to refactor it first, and then begin work through every writing and the re-architecture process. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the lines are blurry there. So, so mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, um, well, it it really it really also well typical consulting answer. It, it depends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, there you go. No, the thing is, the thing is uh, basically um, there is a lot of uh, uh, a lot of basically I call that condensed knowledge, Cond condensed know how how the company works, how the business processes work, condensed in code. And you don't necessarily want to throw that away. What has been proven working, you just want to modernize it. 
hence mm -hmm. well, that's why we're here you, uh, but uh, you don't want to you don't want to throw away uh, your uh, all that knowledge about your internal business pro processes unless you're trying to reorganize these processes as well mm -hmm. or okay. another use case that i've i've dealt with uh, last year is if you're on a platform speak mainframe um where you have uh, tons of COBOL and PL1 code. And you, you, you can you simply, there might be some ways to really do it. But uh, in, in those cases, what you really have to do is, well, following that same strangler pattern approach, uh, carve out those modules, but uh, you, cannot, you cannot migrate like uh, PL, PL1 code um, without, uh, without any hassle to, to Java code, for example. In those cases, it's, it's basically rewriting is more or less the only option you have. I know I'm not technically correct. There are some translation mechanisms mm -hmm. for, for COBOL and, and PL1 to Java, but uh, well, with mixed results. So mm -hmm. in those cases, in those cases, if you want to modernize that, um, you just have to rewrite. Okay, thank you both. Um, the next question, and I think this is really, this is related to the study. What's the size of, Modernization, modernization projects in terms of the number of applications in a project? Yeah, typically, I think, you know, what where we've looked at it um, and kind of what, at least when I, we dive into it, a project itself is usually one application. So it's a monolithic application. Um, there's a, um, uh, you know, a broader mandate to modernize more applications. So usually it's within the context of a broader modernization. Uh, initiative, but a project itself is typically one application or monolithic application, um, and that could be you know small, as Marcus said, but also you know the, the ones that uh, typically where people raise their hands for help are the ones that are you know millions and millions of lines of code, thousands, tens of thousands of, of Java classes, for example, um, where it's difficult to really get in there and detangle um, this, this tangled you know ball of string and begin to pull out um, the different dependencies and uh, different services themselves. So um, you start with one application. Typically, once that starts going, you can build a, a flow, a factory model that is much more repeatable. Um, and your, your team is trained. Uh, you understand some of the tooling, some of the approach. Um, the business side understands what they're expecting if you've had success, and then the engineering side does too. So part of it is getting that flow going from a factory perspective. Usually. Most organizations don't have just one monolith <laughs> that's sitting on top of, uh, you know, maybe hundreds or thousands we've seen. Um, they know there's a core set that need to be modernized first, um, but there's a, a broader set that need to um, be addressed. And that's where prioritization happens and where um, having a set of best practices um, where you've had some success to be able to move them forward in a much more efficient way. Yeah. Okay. Um, Go ahead, Marcus. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, that. Uh, that also we have we have some customers the minority though um, that would ask us okay can you help us with this one or two applications however then more often than not we tell them okay so if you're doing this in a one-off typical project approach what will happen is you will invest a lot of time and resources and then it will happen successfully hopefully and then uh, that team will dissolve again. And then a couple of months later, you think, OK, now this application and then all that knowledge will be lost. So what we typically tell our customers, why not uh, take a step back and look at the application portfolio? There might be applications that are actually not worth looking at because they will be decommissioned uh, the, uh, the next year or so uh, anyways. But looking at the bigger portfolio and then also building a strategy from that um, is definitely worthwhile effort because what what we preach uh, to our customers is um, use um, basically capture all the information, even the slightest bits of information. Of also, uh, there's nothing wrong with failing with things. You can learn from a failure. You can learn from a technology used wrong. So, but document that because what will happen if you have a uh, if you have a bigger uh, endeavor like like I, I see basically coming back to the question i see everything from 30 to hundreds the biggest customer that we're still currently dealing with it's a long running thingy of course 
um, they have 800 applications that they're looking at. It's obviously a very large organization, but uh, it, it's somewhere between a, a few and large numbers. So there's no real thing. So I would say the average is, is about 100, 150, something like that. Uh, they have more, but those are the ones in focus. Um, so going uh, um, going back to um, this cycle that you're going through with uh, with these applications. So what you what you would typically do is harvest all that information into some kind of knowledge base, what we call typically a cookbook. Cookbook because when I encounter this library, when I encounter this technology, when I encounter this setting, I can after the third or fourth or fifth application, I can then just pull out the recipe because that problem has already been solved by someone else, of course, because I'm in a I'm a developer in a different uh, a different application department, for example. But I can pull out that knowledge. I, I can just apply it instead of reinventing the wheel. And that's what happens if you're doing this one application, then crickets. Mm -hmm. Next application, crickets. If you don't if you don't harvest that, and also if you don't have that team, that enabling team, um, that uh, 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 that to a certain extent uh, um, controls, uh, uh, steers that whole endeavor, and also uh, onboards the developer teams um, onto the new mm. technology. So that yeah. goes a little bit to the to the uh, uh, to the uh, finding that that uh, the study has. Uh, define, align, and train the team. So basically, if you're tasking if you're tasking a team that has never seen containers with uh, uh, migrating a monolith into con uh, into a containerized world, you will have problems. Mm -hmm. So nothing that cannot be solved. But you need to identify. Okay, so what's the maturity of the team? What's what are the processes uh, around it? So um, just a simple example. Um, Modernizing something with a customer, but the customer has is, is really I, I call that process ridden, because uh, even though they have the nicest technology now, they're still due to their process requirements and regulatory requirements and basically all very heavily siloed uh, uh, um, uh, organization. They basic they're still just releasing quarterly because they they can't so. You mm -hmm. have to look at the you have to look at the bigger picture, but I'm I'm digressing here. So yeah, I I think it's consistent. We uh, V function came out with their moder with our modernization hub you know, a couple of years ago, focused on refactoring, and it being, became pretty clear that um, from a project perspective, it was successful. But the front end of assessment and prioritization and kind of building the pipeline and getting all that um, tooling up front and all that analysis up front. Uh, was a, a key requirement to create a kind of continuous assessment model. You're always assessing, you're always trying to flow applications in. So you have that set of best practices. So I think we see a very consistent thing. And then we have an assessment version of the product and, and then a modernization uh, version, which allows them to create a, a much more consistent kind of a, a, a continuum around modernization. You're assessing, you're always modernizing. It is not just a project one-off basis. So, um, and I think that's the next phase that we're, kind of pushing towards is, you know, moving towards a way you're always measuring your technical debt. You're always trying to understand, you know, there's microservices that become macro services that become, you know, monolithic services. And we've begun to see that happen too, where you're, you have very chunky services that aren't optimally defined that have been actually not, um, all the context of has been plugged into it. And these are big services. Um, and you want to be able to have much more nimble service going forward. So, all those things, I think, are part of the uh, where the where the market's headed, where the industry's headed. But yeah, we have to get through all these app modernization challenges first. So, so and this is a, a question that is on Cubevert. So, this is the comment, and then they're asking to hear your thoughts on this. So, the comment is Cubevert can be an interim state, and then there's a drawback of dependency on bare metal. What are your thoughts on that comment? Yeah. Uh, are, you, are you asking me or to whoever, yeah. wa whoever wants to take it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I can be. <laughs> this is just started. Yeah, so basically, <clears throat> um, and uh, basically, Bob said that uh, uh, already, and that um, that's what I see as well. 
So nothing can be as permanent as temporary solutions. So uh, basically that, that is a risk that is a risk um, you're facing with customers that would just say, okay, yeah, now it runs on Kubernetes. Great. Next. Um, and yeah, so that, that, that is a problem. Um, it should always be clear for, for, for modernization purposes. There are obviously other use cases uh, where, uh, um, where um, a cube vert totally makes sense to, to run VMs on Kubernetes in uh, for for the foreseeable future but when it comes to modernization the goal is not to make your monolith run on kubernetes uh, the goal is to modernize and so this would be an interim step however that step makes it easier makes the whole modernization process easier because you're not facing okay you uh, uh, you now need to have like uh, um, uh, firewalls opened, uh, specific uh, specific network routing, uh, uh, all all these things, because you're basically on the same network now, you're in, on the on the same platform, on the same network. Otherwise, you always have the um, uh, the problem that you're uh, uh, that you're uh, crossing boundaries of uh, um, maybe also organization wise crossing boundaries, and you have to file tickets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that just helps the process. And yes um nested virtualization is never a good thing so that's you have to you have to run it on uh, uh, on bare metal yes it will it's it's a trade off of sorts so if you're if you're let's say on on vmware and you only have v vmware just just to name one um then uh, that is probably not an option for you because uh, then setting up an extra bare metal and there's no operations team that knows how to how to maintain that bare metal and, and that's probably not uh, not a good thing to do and that's basically because well nested virtualization uh, well you can play around with that uh, uh, but uh, uh, that's nothing that should go into production because there's there could be so many problems between those uh, 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 virtualization um, uh, layers that uh, and also well performance you, you can probably tackle performance with more power but uh, still there's there be dragons <laughs> so um, <laughs> don't don't do it and okay. that is that is a trade off you have to make okay um, and this is for I believe both of you what are examples of successful case studies using the strangler pattern for a non trivial containerized application. So something that's 50 to 100 containers. Yeah, I think most likely I, over that. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure Marcus had had a lot of case studies on that. We've got several on our, our side, Justin and Paulo, uh, Trend Micro, uh, who've gone through this. Um, and um, all of them kind of share that same set of patterns of um, you know complexity, but also a lot of risk and a lot of frustration. Um, some failed efforts in advance of where they came into this and the ability to then uh, also use that strangler pattern to begin to move that into a uh, successful use case. So some of those are available on our website. Um, there's a cool product from AWS called Refactor Spaces too um, that does some of the uh, automatic strangler pattern with the networking components. And that's another area you can look at for the actual um, strangler um, effort, of how you do that on top of AWS is called AWS Refactor Spaces, part of the Migration Hub uh, product too. So they have some use cases there around how you can, once you've done the modernization, how you use strangler pattern to begin to shut down one side and begin to enable another side. Yeah, and so uh, well, I have to I have to be honest. I'm not really sure what customer names from my recent experience I'm allowed to mention. <laughs> So I would have to I would have to just point you to well for example uh, uh, V Functions website Red Hat's website uh, and there well the, the strangler pattern it, it's not new it has been around since I think 2004 or so um, so uh, that has been applied uh, in, in in many cases uh, so well modernization every time you build something even the greatest uh, latest and greatest and most shiny technology that you uh, that you're building today will be considered legacy in five years mm -hmm. so uh, the thing is that's why you have to be continuous in, in in these efforts and make sure whatever you do today will be technical depth also in five years 
So um, this pattern has been around uh, for quite a while, and all you can all you can do, and that's one of the reasons why why people do uh, uh, these kinds of modernizations, is if you have smaller components to uh, uh, to, to 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 manage, speak microservices, or right size services, or whatever you want to call them. Um, so smaller components that are independently deployable, easier to manage uh, with uh, defined boundaries uh, uh, um, tied to a specific business need. Um, so that would make it easier, it will make it easier in the future to, uh, uh, to tackle that technical debt. That will be, no doubt, will be there in, in, uh, uh, in a couple of years. Okay, awesome. Um, so we have kind of the opposite question being asked now. Are there any public case studies or public articles about modernization or failed modernizations or less than optimal ones? So anything that's seen as an anti-pattern that others can learn from? Do you guys know of any public references on that? Yeah, uh, I probably anonymized because <laughs> I, I don't I don't think a customer would like to be in the in the press, if you will, uh, for a failed project um but uh um, yeah. i would say that our the, the survey provides that kind of anonymous you know conclusion around why they're failing you know failure set expectations you know lack of a business plan lack of intelligent tools um there's a lot of uh, uh i think indications in the survey itself that that's one reason we wanted to do the survey is you know to move from the anecdotal side of things to actually begin to measure what people are saying it fails and why they failed in the past and how they look to um, kind of succeed in the future. So. Okay. And then uh, related to the study, Bob, do you have any details on of the monolith applications mm -hmm. that the mm -hmm. participants were using? Was it Java, Net? Yeah. So um, part of the selection criteria was they, they had Java and uh, Java applications that are looking to modernize. Um, so that was a, um, a part of the process. So we're getting into a, so we're not just going into an environment where they're running already in microservices or, you know, you know, et cetera. So uh, we went into organizations that had applications of a certain size and um, in a cer certain kind of groups of applications and began to then look at um, the demographics and uh, the cohorts around uh, the business leaders versus the application architects too within those groups. Um, but in order to qualify, they had to have some, at least uh, we use Java as the leading indicator. Um, typically, what we find if they have Java, they have some .NET. And typically, there's some COBOL and some other stuff in there, too. So, um, yeah. So. Okay. Um, and then I think this is related to one of the learnings from the study. Mm -hmm. So the, the comment is, a hidden learning seems to not be technology-related to people. Mm -hmm. There is quote unquote required org structure changes. The DevOps slash SRE would seem to require this, but what are they missing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'd say that there's the DevOps side of things. You start looking at having the right um, uh, DevOps technology, and that kind of goes for all cloud native stuff around CI, CD, and all the building out the pipelines and uh, being able to do all the uh, continuous delivery. Um, having that, um, most organizations have begun to move that um, into, into place. I think the harder issue is for application, existing application teams, many of which are, are monolithic in nature because they're built, they're maintaining a monolithic application, to begin to, to migrate to something more of a, a topology around a domain-driven microservices and you have a team on, on each service. Um, and I think that's the next step. You, you, you've got to have the DevOps and cloud native technology in place. Ah, team topology is nice. <laughs> um, that's that's a book we all swear by, right? Yeah. Um, so that is uh, uh, everyone who has not read it, just just Google team topologies. So I have the blur kicking in here. So now I can see it. Uh, Matthew mm -hmm. Skelton, uh, Manuel Pais, team topologies. Just Google that. It will be one of the first hits. Um, that is super helpful because I also I also said uh, it's it's super important to look at the at the processes and at the team structures because mm -hmm. well as as you said Bob um, when you have a monolithic application you typically have a monolithic team so mm -hmm. and uh, you will you will want to when when you 
focus on smaller services that serve a specific uh, uh, um, that are in a specific business domain and and, uh, and and serve a specific purpose you will you want to organize your team around that and on the other hand also what you want to do is uh, you want to um, uh, you want to enable your organization so we don't say we don't say like uh, modernization means you have to restructure the whole company no that's not the mm -hmm. case but you have to you have to uh, establish some some good well hence the name team topologies well who who is reporting to whom who is doing what who is helping whom and who is organized around uh, um, uh, around value streams meaning uh, who is providing value building an application that serves a purpose and who is like in an organizational uh, um, uh, uh, sorry uh, in a, in a um, in a vertical, uh, uh, in a ver vertical approach, who is uh, supporting multiple teams, onboarding, uh, and, and building the feedback loop between developers, for example, developers and the platform team that is now managing the Kubernetes platform. So, what features do the developers, as platform users, what do they need to achieve those? Tying back to the beginning, those target outcomes. Mm -hmm. So. It's all interconnected, as you can see. But this is definitely also well. Summertime is coming, so if you don't have anything to read on the beach, uh, this is a good one. <laughs> yeah, agreed. All right, guys. So uh, last question, then we can wrap it up. We're at the hour mark. The question is: Is there a recommended tool stack from assessment to planning to actual implementation, like reading code analysis and code converters, which V function and Red Hat use or recommend? So I'm sure you both have uh, answers to this. Uh, Bob, you can go ahead first. Yeah, well, I mean, this is right in the heart of what B function does in terms of um, automated assessment, technical debt analysis uh, for prioritization, and then a modernization hub where we actually will do the refactoring and dependency analysis. And so we, this is kind of the, the heart of what we do. Um, we integrate with, a, with OpenShift and, and a bunch of other kind of platforms in terms of uh, target uh, cloud native environments. And uh, so that's a, so we work work well with the Red Hat team in that respect. Um, and we're really more focused on getting into the application itself, understanding dependencies, beginning to untangle those and helping the architect uh, refactor and build those new microservices. So, so we'd recommend that. And there's a variety of other kind of tools that go around that, um, that I think the OpenShift community kind of fills in. So. Yeah, sp speaking of community, since this is the conveyor mm -hmm. community call, uh, there's obviously also some some tools uh, um, in the in the conveyor community. However, um, um, probably uh, looking at things from a, from a different angle. So what uh, um, uh, what the V function tool set does is, uh, is is much more sophisticated and in depth uh, than uh, uh, than the uh, um, uh, than the uh, con conveyor tool set because it looks at things from 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 a different angle. Um, so and there there are obviously also some overlaps. And uh, uh, I would I would think well I typically work with mostly um, uh, mostly with uh, a conveyor because those are also the the upstream versions of the uh, Red Hat products. But uh, um, I would expect beyond V function. Well, I've had the pleasure Bob, uh, to to work with you before and, and uh, mm -hmm. present that internally at Red Hat. But uh, uh, the thing is, so I know V function and there's probably others as well. So there, going back to the question, there is no recommended tool stack. There's nothing like do it this way and everything will be good. It also depends on, let's say, let's say I get from 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 V function very sophisticated. I get uh, I get the whole uh, uh, dependency chain untangled. I know where the where my transaction boundaries are. So basically, all the work is carved out for me. But I don't have anyone uh, who actually knows uh, how to uh, how to move this into uh, into a container. So you have to look at the at the bigger yeah. picture. So not not I just have to quote it because I, I do that every time. A, fo a fool with a tool is still a fool. <laughs> so the, thing, <laughs> the, the the tool might be great, but you you have to look at the bigger picture because. Yeah. Um, well. yeah. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, I just had one last question. I, this just came in. Based on your engagements, what is the percent of customers that are comfortable with managing and operating Kubernetes clusters? Um. 
coming uh, sorry how many customers are coming into to uh, asking red hat to to operate uh, or um, sorry i didn't get that fully that question so just based on the interactions you've had what is the percent of customers that are comfortable with managing and operating kubernetes clusters ah all right okay so missed the middle part um so, uh, and that's on their own yeah, yeah on, on on prem so uh, we see the shift we see the shift currently uh, of of customers moving on kubernetes in the cloud for for example well in our case obviously uh, um, uh, managed OpenShift on Azure on AWS, uh, for example. So, I as a customer don't have to worry about uh, uh, managing my clusters, etc. I'm just consuming. I'm just consuming all the goodness, and I don't have to have people who are actually doing that. I, I can basically free up those people. However, the, obviously there's a cost involved. So, and and other customers, mostly in the in the highly regulated uh, environments such as uh, uh, banking, insurance, uh, medical services, we see those uh, trying to uh, um, um, well consolidate their their data centers. But uh, for for regulatory purposes, uh, they can't move everything uh, uh, high um, highly confident uh, data uh, to the cloud. So, it's. However, from my experience, I'm, I'm not a market researcher, but from my personal experience, what I see customers are more and more shifting what they can to the cloud. So, so uh, Red, Hat, Red Hat is doing more and more of these hybrid cloud projects also where these regulatory customer, uh, uh, regulatory uh, inflicted customers, um, um, they're keeping the core data in house because they have to. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that they don't have workloads that can well work very well on uh, um, uh, on on a managed and hosted Kubernetes. So so this hybrid approach is also uh, um, we're also seeing more and more of that because then you can basically you can manage it as one tag it appropriately and say okay these workloads will go out there and these have to stay in house uh, along with their associated data of course uh, and so. Mm. There is no, there is a trend, but no, no. seventy eight percent are doing this. And Bob, do you have any input or anything? Yeah, add? yeah. On the uh, on on the Kubernetes, I'm, what I would say is that with the cloud provider um, services are are getting are very mature. The, the OpenShift services around Kubernetes, I think the management and operation and tooling around that has gotten very mature and kind of much more predictable. There's still a training issue. There's still like a, a lack of uh, a skilled personnel. So I mean, it's hard to put a number on it, but I think the uh, for people who are looking to get confidence that want to get comfortable with managing it, um, using a service to start with, a um, managed service, um, and then working your way into maybe something you would do on your own. Uh, will be something will be the trend to go to but um, the managed services are very predictable and i see we see that in, in most cases somewhere in an organization there's a there's a team that feels comfortable with it i just wouldn't say across an, an entire enterprise organization there's a, a, a broad level of comfort but there's pockets within almost every organization where there's the expertise that's de developing or developed so awesome well guys um uh, let's go ahead and close this out do any of you have any closing thoughts uh, you want to share with the audience and maybe how they can reach you if they have any questions or anything they should check out. Yeah, well, I just want, want to say thank you all for um, uh, letting us share our, our perspectives on application modernization, the challenges. I'm Bob at Defunction, um, you know, Bob Quillinet you know, on Twitter also, so you can track me down there, but Bob at Defunction, if you want to email, have any questions, and uh, look forward to seeing you all out there. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Marcus, any closing remarks? Well, yeah, you, you can reach me. That's a little more complicated. I should have thought about that, but uh, uh, creating an alias. Um, but um, uh, it's M. Nagel, so Marcus Nagel, so first letter of the first name, M. Nagel at Red Hat. So you can reach me also anytime uh, if there's questions. Uh, um, or just uh, ping your nearest, uh, your nearest Red Hatter. Um, so there's well thanks for, for 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 watching and listening and as you can see i i i can fill whole evenings i can i can blow parties with just talking about <laughs> application modernization so uh, uh.
uh, thanks for bearing with me. Thanks, guys. And thanks, everyone. Until next time. Bye. Great. Thank you all.